possible. So with that, please give a warm welcome to Mika Brzezinski and Joe Scarborough. Thanks very much. This is so exciting. I've got to say, as a founding member of the Massachusetts Women's Conference, it is quite a crowd. Hey, Joe. This is inspiring. Joe. I'll tell you, Mika's book. Joe. Yeah. Women's Conference. Yeah. Women. Right. Zip. Zip. Okay. I'll start this one. Okay. I'll sit down. Thank you here. so much for having us, everybody. My gosh, look at this crowd. There's thousands of people here. Anybody here watch Morning Joe? Okay, so then you'll know that we've been on the air for about four years, and you'll also know that Joe likes to talk. Does anybody agree with me on that? So we're going to control this situation. What I've done, Joe, yeah. is I just I have some questions here for you. Okay. And if you could stick to script, okay. that would be great. Okay. Have you ever done that before? Oh, okay. I don't know. Okay, let me look at the first question. Here we go. Why did you write this book? What a great question. Thank you. Uh, the book is called Knowing Your Value. Um, and that is just such a brilliant question. I don't know where you got that. Uh, the, the book is based on our experience putting together Morning Joe, which four years ago, Joe came up with the idea out of thin air after that situation with Don Imus. You want to talk about that? No. You may. No, no. Wait, would Don Imus got in trouble uh, after he decided to talk about women's college basketball. And there was an opportunity for us to start a show, and, um, and it went well. I mean, we, uh, we actually, Mika and I met the night before the show started, and I knew that I had found the right co-host because I, I met her, and about two minutes in, she insulted me. Well, I said, this will work well on TV, and, and it did. But, uh, but a fascinating thing happened. We went on the show. It worked, and we immediately found ourselves in very different situations. Why don't you give them a background on where you were at the time and how it caused some problems that actually led to you almost leaving the show and writing this book? Yes, uh, because obviously the topic here is being fearless and also obviously the book Knowing Your Value, and value came into the play as we were putting this show together. We both realized the show was going to be good, but we were pretty much the only ones. NBC wasn't so sure, and they were trying out other people, looking at other concepts. Meanwhile, we kept our noses to the grindstone, traveled the country, covered the primaries, booked the candidates, and together we worked on building the vision of Morning Joe, which was based on a philosophy of civility, a philosophy and a vision that Joe came up with. Joe was coming from, what was that show called? Scarborough country. Yes. So he was already employed at MSNBC and he had a certain value, a number, money that he was being paid. I had been at the top of my career about a year and a half earlier at CBS News. I'd gotten just about what you would consider the best job a journalist could ever ask for in TV news, and that's a contract at 60 Minutes, as well as an anchor slot on the CBS Evening News Sunday. And six months after that happened, Dan Rather was fired, the Memogate scandal unfolded, a new president of CBS News was brought in, and I was fired on my 39th birthday. And for a year, I couldn't find a job. And I had to crawl back in by begging for any job. And I ended up on MSNBC reading cut-ins for 30 seconds in between the shows they had in the evening. One of them was uh, Scarborough Country. Uh, so that's actually how uh, Joe and I met because Scarborough Country went off the air when Morning Joe began because he came to put the show on the air. But my value was different. My value was from someone who was working freelance at MSNBC. But the show was developing its own value. It was bringing in money for MSNBC. And when we both signed contracts at MSNBC, we were obviously coming from different angles. Having said that, I did not help myself, and ultimately I signed a deal that wasn't my value, that was way below my value. I couldn't see my value if it hit me in the face. And I realized I was about 40 at that point that I had repeated the same problem that I had 
uh, executed with precision time and time again in my career, which was scrambling to get the opportunity, being so grateful for it, trying to get the next opportunity, and taking a hit on the money and always ending up being paid a little bit less than I'm worth or a lot less than I'm worth. And in this case, when we were traveling the country, we began to share information about the contracts that we had and talk about other people that we were hiring for the show because we ran the show together. So money became an issue. And, well, what did we, should I tell them what we found out or is that Oh, not? sure, go ahead. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Why don't you tell them? I don't know what you're talking about, so you tell. <laughs> uh, ultimately, our salaries were a little different. They should be different, but they were 14 times different. Joe was making 14 times more than well, me. I didn't know you were going to tell him that. Well, I'm sorry. I thought that's what you... I was going to yeah. give you the yeah. opportunity to say it. Yeah. But it was a big disparity. And when we realized that, we realized we had a problem. We had a problem. Because while the show was Joe's vision, the show was nothing. There was no Morning Joe without me. And I think you can take yeah, it from there. Yeah, and you know, th that's one of the fascinating things, not only about what happened with us on the show, but also one of the fascinating things is Mika was going through her negotiating with NBC. Um, and she really didn't uncover this until she started writing the book, that Mika was fantastic at telling me what my value was. Right? In fact, when we first started this show, five minutes into it, she leaned over and said, this is going to be a big hit. This show is going to work, and politicians are going to want to come here. This is going to be, I didn't, I said, yeah, that's great, that's great. And I would have people come up to the show, and they would come in to be interviewed, and I'd get up to shake their hands, and she'd be like, sit down. They're lucky to be here. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> but the thing that Mika did not realize and the more she talked to other women, and I want you to talk about mm -hmm. some of these interviews with, with, with women who are, are really influential, Mika was the last person to know her value. And while she could teach me how to negotiate with NBC, and while she was the toughest fighter for her children, and for her husband, and for her family, and for her show, when it came to Mika knowing her value and fighting for your value. Terrible. It was terrible. And in fact, when you started going around trying to talk to other women mm -hmm. about what your value was inside the company, what happened? Well, that's a fascinating story. How many women here relate with this? How many of you find yourselves to be extremely comfortable when you're fighting for someone else? Let's say it's one of your kids. Let's say it's your boyfriend. How about a business partner? How about a husband? Are you the best advocate for him usually? Probably. Do you find yourself having a harder time advocating for yourself? How many women feel a little bit uncomfortable advocating for themselves? How many women feel a little uncomfortable advocating for themselves when it comes to money? How many women think it might even look bad to advocate for themselves for money. Might be a little unseemly. Yeah, that's the problem because women managers know you feel that way. And ultimately, we've got a few stories about dealing with the male president of MSNBC and we will show the examples of how men approach negotiating and how women do. But before I get there, Joe brings up a really good point. Women. We use our weaknesses against each other, especially when we're negotiating. And it's up to us to cut through that by being clear and by cutting the drama and by pushing back when necessary. You know, I was doing an interview for the book with Carol Smith, who is the editor of Elle magazine at one time, and she was talking about how she hires a lot of women and the differences in how women ask for money and men. And she was really, we were talking about the problems she's confronted in her career. But Here's what fell out of her mouth, sort of by mistake. She said, women feel so grateful to be there, to be able to have their children, their husbands, and their jobs, and they're always scrambling around, and they kind of feel like they should undercut themselves a little bit because they're so grateful just to have the opportunity. Put a quote around that. She goes, in fact, I hire a lot of women for four-day weeks 
because I'll usually get six days of work out of them. They're so grateful. And then she stopped and she said, did I just say that? And I said, yes, you did. Yes, you did. It was a perfect example of how literally women can use each other's weaknesses against each other and even capitalize on them. I had a situation at MSNBC with the vice president while I was trying to fix the situation of the disparity between our salaries. And she told me, this is a really bad time, Mika. Don't, don't ask for this raise right now. People won't like you. You're going to get a bad reputation. People are going to start thinking you're a problem. And you know what I did? There were two words I should have used. They're words that Joe uses all the time with his boss. I didn't. I didn't push back. We'd still be friends today, and she wouldn't be in this book if I'd pushed back and fixed the problem right then and there. But what did I do? Go ahead. Yeah, she, so Mika, yeah, too embarrassed Mika to even came say back it. to the office, and she was actually crying. She was like, <laughs> I was like, what's wrong? Don't do that. Why are it's you crying? Worst. I take the meeting, didn't go well, and Mika never cries. And she's like, <laughs> she said they wouldn't like me if I asked for a raise. I said they're not supposed to like you. They're supposed to give you money because you deserve the money. Show me the money. And she's crying. And she's like, hold on a second. Maybe you're right, but this underlines a bigger point about the difference between how most men ask for a raise right. and how most women ask for a raise. Oh, now, I think God. as a public we service, suck. look at this. We've okay. got a big stage. All right. So as a public service, yeah. let's show them the two different ways. Okay. Let's start with a woman. So with I'm Phil woman? Griffin. So You're I'll be Phil, Phil Griffin. Griffin. I'm the president of MSNBC. Okay. And Mika is Mika and many other women asking for a raise. So this is how I did it. I signed a really bad deal and I make really bad money and I'm going to fix it now, okay? Hey, Mika. Hi, I'm sorry. Well, I know what, this what is are you a bad time. I'm sorry. I know this is a really bad time. It's probably a really bad time for the company and I'm... I'm well, you know, it it's is a bad fault. time. It's I, my fault. I gotta, I gotta go get some drinks. Well, but I just. What? I wanted to ask you. Um, yeah. What? I, I, it's what? kind of a bad time, and I'm sorry because I. It is the bad. One. I gotta go. And listen, it's been great seeing you. By the way, how's Joe doing? doing? Uh, he's doing great. Am I doing a good job? Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're doing fine. Doing fine. Okay. So, yeah. All right. All right. See ya. So I didn't get the raise, but he really likes me. So. That's cool. Uh, yeah. How many of you today have used the S word? S, exactly. I'm sorry. How many of you used it? Just in any way? Yeah, oh my God. I'm sorry, it's a bad time. I'm sorry to interrupt. Hey, I'm sorry. Stop it. You're not sorry. If you say you're sorry, especially when you're going into a negotiation, you're literally saying don't Give me the raise. Please, Please don't, don't give me give the raise. Me the money. And by the way, you don't have to explain to your boss that your kids need braces. Don't play the victim. That's got nothing to do with how much money you are owed by the company. It's not Phil's fault. If you decide to take the money that your kid needs and blow it on a weekend in Vegas, that's not your boss's it's like problem either. It's nobody's problem. Which leads they don't care to how men ask for raises. I'll be Phil. In this scene, Mika Brzezinski is played by our Phil Griffin is played by Mika Brzezinski. Joe Scarborough is played, played by Joe. This is how I keep getting raises. You may not want to try this. It's just work for me. But this is how a lot of men do it. Hey, Phil, how you doing? Hey, buddy, how you doing? Uh, I don't know why That's you awesome. would call me your buddy. What? The fact of the matter is. We have more people watching our show now than you ever had under Imus. Yeah. I need a raise. Show's good. I need no. a big raise. No. No. What do you mean, no? Joe, kiss off. I'm hey, not giving you okay, a raise. Okay, okay. I've, got a, I've got another idea. So let's try this tact. Why don't you keep that attitude up? Mm -hmm. I'll walk out the front door here. 
I'll go to another network. I'll start my own show. I'll buy that network. I'll destroy your network. I will buy your building. I will burn down your building. And I will salt the earth to make sure nothing ever grows there again. All right, you can have the freaking raise. It's fine. All it's right. fine, Joe. You can have it. By the way, did you see Pooh Holtz just signed with awesome. the Angels? Awesome. great. Is that not amazing? It's amazing. You going hey, Friday? Say hi to All Corey, right. okay? Yeah. We'll All talk right. to you soon. Catch you later. Yeah. Guys, get away with that. And I'm not saying you need to act that way, and Meek is not saying you need to act that oh, way, but it underlines no. an important point. Not stylistically, because you don't want to drop the F-bombs that I drop when I'm screaming oh, at Oh, you Phil. don't want to act that way. But when it comes to substance, I never once talked about the fact that I was tired of living in a small apartment in New York City, and I wanted to buy a house in Connecticut. I never once talked about my kids' braces. I never once talked about the fact that I'm having trouble with my parents and I got to move my mom into a new home because of this. No. It wasn't about that. It was about what I was owed, which leads, Mika, to what you talk about in this book, about how you finally got your... So talk about you how you finally became, went from being one of the lowest paid women at MSNBC to the highest pay. It was a four-step process. The first three are what not to do. Don't apologize. The second time I went in there, I played the victim, and I was teary. The third time I went, there, <laughs> I went in there, I tried to act like Joe. And that, that was a work. disaster. Don't do that. that was the most, I had to black, the, I had to dig deep to write that because I blacked it out. Hey, it you was one do of those moments really you don't want to remember. Really quickly. Yeah. This is how this meeting went. Because she said, okay, well, Joe yells and screams and points fingers. Spits, I'm going to try it. Okay. Spits. So I'll Phil. be Phil. Oh, you're Phil? Phil, hey. F-bomb. F-bomb this, man. F-bomb. I, I am tired of making 14 times less than Joe. You can you... F-bomb off. You need to pay me what I am worth. Hold on. Hold on. And then he poked me back. <laughs> it was so bad. And we both froze and looked at each other and were like, ooh. And then I believe I was slunk out of there because it was not authentic and it felt so completely out of character. I realized I'd failed. And he called Joe and asked Joe this. Dude, is that woman crazy or what? I was. I was. At that point, the situation had gotten out of control. The situation was terrible for the show. The show is based on an organic, transparent process. We're happy to be on the air together. We're happy to be on the air with Willie, with Mike Barnacle, with all of our Morning Joe family members. But I sat down one day in the middle of this process, I'm at probably step two at this point, and I looked around and I realized because I'd gathered my information, which is what you're supposed to do before you go into negotiation, I realized I was the lowest paid at the table. The only woman and the lowest paid at the table. So it wasn't just the disparity between me and Joe. It was the overall situation which needed to be fixed. So how did things get fixed? Well, there were a couple of things that happened that ultimately led to step four. <laughs> and uh, I did ultimately fail. I didn't get it done. And I felt very unhappy about this. And I realized that it wasn't worth doing this. The show would end badly because we're so transparent. If I had an Ambien the night before, chances are you're going to know, because I'm going to tell you or Joe's going to out me. That's how transparent we are. I became convinced that like a bad relationship, the show would end badly, because my anger would show on the air, and I would ultimately hurt, hurt myself. I had, by the way, missed a number of opportunities to make money on this show. Halfway through the process, I had ripped that script up. This is when the show was beginning, a Paris Hilton situation. They actually called me in and offered me a fourth hour on MSNBC, MSNBC Live with Mika Brzezinski. And you know what I said? Well, I'll tell you what Joe would have said. Joe would have said, really, a fourth hour? How much is that gonna cost you? Because that's more work. You know what I said? Thank you. Thank you 
40 years old, seriously? So then we had a situation where I was doing the fourth hour. Joe and Willie and Mike would lumber off the set and be like, oh, ah, I'm glad we're done with what we learned today. I'm going to go sit down. I'm tired. And I'd be doing another hour for nothing. That is an opportunity, uh, that is a situation, a textbook example of missing the moment when it slaps you in the face. Ultimately, I told Joe I couldn't stay. I quit. I told him first because I felt we had built this show together. I owed, I owed him that information. And Joe asked me to wait two weeks, and then he did something a little bit unconventional. Would you like to tell them about that? Well, I, I actually waited those two weeks. I was done. I was fixing up my affairs so that I could figure out how I would continue without the salary that I had. I logged onto my bank account, and all of a sudden I saw this money in there. More money than I'd probably seen made in six months. And I, well, the first thing I thought was, did MSNBC screw up? And if so, do I have to give this back? After I processed that and realized there's no way they'd screw up that way, uh, I realized something else was going on, and here's what it was. Joe had negotiated not only his good salary, but ratings bonuses. He said to them, if I can beat what Imus was making, and if I can beat that, and if I can beat that, you guys have to give me bonuses. And he had one of those bonuses diverted into my bank account. I don't know why you did that at first. In fact, I was a little upset with him, which led to a pretty heated conversation between us. It did. It, it led to a heated conversation. I had done it, though. And again, along the lines of why I did everything at work the way I did, I had done it for business reasons. And I knew that Mika was Morning Joe. I knew that... If she wasn't on the show, our show wouldn't do well. And all of these ratings bonuses that I was getting in, I knew a lot of it had to do with because what she brought to the table every morning. So I went to the president, I went to Phil, and I said, I want you to divert my ratings bonuses to Mika's account. He's like, yeah, we, we can't do that. Nobody, nobody does that. Nobody's ever done that. And so he sent me to the head of HR. I told the head of HR, I divert the ratings bonuses, who then sent me to NBC's top lawyer and said, no, 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 we, we, we just can't, we can't do this. I said, I will sign a letter over to you. I want my ratings bonuses diverted over to Mika's account. And you, at the end, he asked why. I said, well, for a couple of reasons. One is because she makes the show. And two, when the New York Times writes a story, about how my equal co-host makes 14 times less than me, I want to make sure that I'm looking good while all of you look like a bunch of misogynistic pigs. <laughs> um, I walked out of there, and uh, I got a call from Phil, said, we're, we're going to divert the bonuses. But Mika got really angry. Again, I made it about me, and I was dramatic. Because Mika was being emotional about it. And I kept saying, you don't understand. This is not about you. This is all about me. I'm being selfish because I know that you make me money. And I know that whatever money I give you today, I will make back 10 times the amount. And guess what? I was wrong. I've probably made back 20 or 30 times the amount of money Seriously, it's amazing. because Mika stayed on the show. And, and that was important, but I still couldn't convince Mika, so I called her into the office. I said, we're going to have an intervention. She said, what are you talking about? I put it on the speakerphone, and I called her father, Dr. Brzezinski, who, by the way, had already called me stunningly superficial on TV. I told you not to have him on the show. So I called him up. I said, Dr. Brzezinski, Joe, this is Joe. I, I, I want to tell you what's going on here. And I explained the situation. And I said, I have diverted my ratings bonuses to Mika. And she thinks this is the worst idea ever and is worried about what people are going to think, that it undercuts her. And Dr. Brzezinski, former national security advisor, one of the smartest guys I've ever met in my life, was quiet for a minute. And then he said, well, you know, 
I do not usually consider you to be an exceedingly bright man. <laughs> but in this case, I think you are dead on point. It seems like a very wise business investment to me. And once again, your father was right. And I took the money. I took the money because I was worth the money and because the show was nothing without me and it was a temporary fix. But ultimately I realized that not only would this be a great book someday, a valuable one, which it really has been, because the textbook problems are problems that I've done over and over again in my career, and many of the successful women that I interview as well found themselves apologizing, playing the victim, chattering amongst them friends, not getting the proper data, and not going in there and talking with clear conviction, authentic presentation, and a real voice about what their value is. And ultimately, I did go in there. I was convinced. I was also, and this is really important, especially in a bad economy, ready to walk. So whether you find a job somewhere else or you figure out your affairs, you've got to go in there with no drama. Only threaten what you plan to do. And I was done. Great that I got the bonuses. It, temp it temporarily fixed the problem, but I still needed to do it myself. I went into Phil Griffin a fourth time, and I said, Phil, here's the deal. We've got to fix this problem, and we've got to fix it now. Because right now, what you are is a bad boyfriend. Does anyone here need the definition of a bad boyfriend? I didn't think so. Phil did. or. Maybe he didn't, but I defined it for him anyway. I said, Phil, a bad boyfriend is a guy that you hang around with, you move in with him, you do his dry cleaning, you cook for him, you, you do his errands, and you think he's going to marry you, and he never marries you. He never does. You need to marry me, or this relationship is over. And it's not over next month or next year. It's over now. Tomorrow morning, there will be a morning Joe without a morning Mika, and you don't want to try that. And he did fix the problem. I have to say, not only did he fix the problem, but he let me write this book. When Joe and I uh, kind of reviewed what had happened, we thought, what are people going to think? My gosh, and what is MSNBC going to think? Because the one thing I didn't do is consider the fact that I still work there. And how am I going to get this through legal? So I went to Phil with the book. Joe and I sat with him. He read the entire book in front of us, page by page. Don't go there? OK. Uh, and he only made a slight change to make some of his more colorful language more accurate. How's that? Is that better? Um, and, we, and we ultimately found that he gave us the green light, just the complete green light for the book. and has been our greatest champion and mine as well, which I really, I have to hand it to him for because this is not an easy story to tell. It's a systemic problem in most industries, including television, and this was a pronounced version of it. And a, a couple of notes on Phil Griffin, uh, who does get hammered in this book. The first thing that, that Phil said to me after the book came out uh, was, Mika needs to write an afterword. Because actually her salary has continued to increase over and over again. And he said she went from, like, we went from paying her nothing to now having to pay her way too much. She's, she's, a, she's about to bankrupt us. But the second thing that Phil said, and the reason why he let this book go through, and this is a message that sometimes you underline more when you have time, never once did Mika say, poor, poor, pitiful me. The men at my job, at my network, are so awful. Phil Griffin is such a terrible person. No, Mika talked about the mistakes that she made and the mistakes that always set women up for failure. That's not to say that there aren't some terrible bosses out there that aren't misogynistic uh, or that don't pay women what they're valued, but the underlying uh, theme of this book is the mistakes that you made and how you were determined to fix them. Absolutely. There are bosses out there that don't pay women their value. The data backs that up, and those bosses are men and women. What this book talks about is a little bit of what we've talked about here today, but ultimately what you'll see is this is the part that we can control. 
This is the part that we can change. This is the information that we can use to actually make a dent in the problem. Because this is how we present ourselves. This is how we approach the problem. We, as in women, approach the problem of talking about our value. We got to get over it. The final thing I learned, the most important thing I learned, is where we started. And that is that it does not matter if they like you in a negotiation. And trust me, do they like me? They do now. They didn't like me during this process. I didn't like me. I was all over the place, dramatic, confrontational, angry. This was not pretty. But ultimately, when I got it done, no, they didn't like me. I cost them a lot of money. It's not a comfortable thing. We have to get comfortable having a conversation where we command respect and put aside the concern about being liked. You will be liked in the long run for that, and you will be kept quite well. Ladies and gentlemen, I've got to say, it's been a great honor to be at a place where I was one of the founding members of the <laughs> Massachusetts Conference for Women. A big hand for Thank Mika you. Brzezinski. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you for having us.